Hey, and welcome to Things Worth Learning. I'm your host, Matt Stauffer. This is a show where a curious computer programmer, that's me, interviews fascinating people about their passions. My guest today is Justin Jackson, Jackson, co-founder of the podcast hosting service Transistor and the creator of about a jillion products and podcasts targeting entrepreneurs and founders. Justin, hey, would you mind telling the audience a little bit about yourself and whether it's your personal or your professional life? Yeah, I mean... I work at Transistor full time now. I've uh, been interested in entrepreneurship for a long time. I'm a dad of four kids. My wife and I just celebrated our 20th anniversary. Congratulations, man. Uh, That's huge. Yeah, it's big. It wasn't, I, I will, whenever I, I talk about that part, I'm like, it wasn't easy <laughs> right <laughs> it's like not all those years but that's why good. it's huge because you <laughs> made it <laughs> uh, and um something that a lot of people don't know about me is that i came into tech late in life hmm. um 28 years old uh the first kind of decade of my life i was a uh, evangelical youth minister mm -hmm. and uh left that world behind in 2008 when I worked for a software company and that's kind of defined me since then. But uh, I had this prior life that nobody yeah. knows about. The, the, one of the first, what is it? You get th you get three decades I or think something? It's, yeah, it's something like, I wish I could remember how they split it up, but yes, that was your first chunk, right? That was my yeah. first chunk, yeah. Uh, which is funny because that's my first chunk too, was I was an evangelical campus minister for the first chunk. Yeah. Went back to software. I, I so. remember chatting with you about that at, a conference mm -hmm. like we were at a speaker's dinner yep and it's a part of my life i don't get to talk about very much and so when i sat down with you and you revealed that about yourself there was definitely this like um safety and mm. also just yearning to be able to talk to somebody mm -hmm. about those things um and maybe we can get into that a bit later. I I, I don't yeah. even really exactly know where how how post evangelical you are. So. Yeah, man, maybe I'll <laughs> be revealing in, it all this podcast. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is it it is important to talk about because North America is uh, has this strong uh, Christian evangelical Catholic yeah. uh, Episcopal um, background context mm -hmm. for. Uh, you know, for decades. And so it's, it's, it's built into the fabric of especially the United States. Yeah. And so I think there's a lot of people who might have similar experiences or struggles or questions. So yeah, yeah I think it might be interesting might to chat. Take us somewhere. And we, we are both people who've been trying to talk publicly about public health or uh, mental health and stuff like that. So turns out this is connected yeah. and it might be helpful to talk about totally. this publicly too. So totally. Yeah. Oh yeah, just uh, uh, about half my time in therapy is just uh, exploring, exploring uh, yep. stuff related to religion and yep. uh, yeah, that whole experience. Yeah. So well, clearly we're going to get there. So thank you for that intro. I'm going to ask you one question and then we'll get right into it. So the one question is: Do you have any sort of life mantra or phrase or idea you try to live your life by? Yeah. So the the most poignant for me is. This quote from James Clear, every mm. action you take is a vote for the type of person you wish to become. Mm. No single instance will trans uh, no single instance will transform your beliefs, but as votes build up, so does the evidence of your identity. This is why habits are crucial. They cast repeated votes for being a type of person. Mm. And so, yeah, for me, especially going through different seasons of life, um, and that includes kind of spirituality and religion, but also career, also relationships, also depression, also, you know, whatever it is, I, I've found that quote to be incredibly helpful yeah. because in the moments where I, when, in the moments where I felt like, I don't know, a shitty dad, yeah. um, I could, look at that quote and go, okay, well, what's just one vote I can take mm -hmm. that will be evidence yeah. that I'm I can a be dad. a better dad. And yeah. it's like, okay, well I can, I'm tired, but I can, t 
take the kids to the trampoline and jump on the trampoline with them. And it was yeah. just a small thing, but it became a vote for the kind of person I wanted to be. That's so cool, man. So yeah, I've, I've referred back to that mm. often. I, uh, Josh Pigford has a, a, a service that will print your tweets out on wood. Yeah. And, uh, I've printed James Clear's tweet oh, out cool. on, in, engraved in wood and have it in our house. Cause it's been so kind of, uh, central for me. That is really cool. Um, I love that idea about the vote for the person you want to be, especially when you're doubting the person you think you are. Um, and I mean, obviously you and I have a, have, have an ongoing dialogue about, you know, depression and anxiety and handling them and stuff like that. But I do think that like, especially in the context of wrestling with our identity after being in a place that kind of provided us a lot of identity, as we're about to talk about being in a place where you yeah. have to figure out your own identity. Again, I don't want to go too deep in the actual topic yet, but like mm -hmm. I can, I can really see the value in learning how to like determine your own identity, I guess, like have an agency over it. Yeah. I think this is also why one of tech, like the tech industry that I'm in now, one of the problems is it's, I mean, even our pop culture is, it's really focused on young people, mm -hmm. folks in their 20s, you know, startup founders, you know, the hot startup founders are in their 20s. Yeah. A lot of the crypto community right now is in their 20s. Or teens. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, or teens. And there's nothing wrong with being in your teens or your 20s. It's an awesome time. For me, uh, you know, life got difficult in my 30s and now 40s. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's challenge there that you don't get, or most, a lot of people don't get when you're kind of in the, again, it's a great stage, that idealistic uh, stage of being in your twenties, mm -hmm. but having older people who can talk openly that life is not just uh, idealistic yeah. uh, clouds and rainbows mm -hmm. is very important for the culture. And I wish I knew more people, uh, older people who had revealed this to me, who had been transparent about mm. it because I, I felt like I just kind of lived in this state of, uh, you know, like public politeness mm -hmm. where everybody just seems to have their shit together and everything's fine. Too and everything's to be stressed. fine. <laughs> and, 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 and to emphasize this even more, like when, when hard stuff started happen to, happening to me, mm -hmm. again, relationships, family, kids, whatever it is, it felt like it was so outside mm -hmm. of what was quote unquote normal mm -hmm. that I really thought I was a deviant. I thought mm -hmm. I, I had deviated from what was normal and healthy. Yeah. Because it just seemed like everybody was walking around with this kind of public persona that's just that denies, you know, and, and kind of um, looks down on things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I often go back to like yeah. the Britney Spears thing, like when 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 she she was going through some stuff and it was in the media. I remember everybody kind of around me being like, whoa, like Britney's crazy, you know? Yeah. yeah. And then in my 30s and 40s. I've identified with that person, that yeah. Brittany, a yeah. lot more going, mm -hmm. uh, that's like people go through that. Yeah. And it, 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 it was odd for me to have people around me treat it as so deviant when mm -hmm. it's like the disruption in my own life has almost matched that. Yeah. And to not have that echoed or mirrored amongst anybody is just like, ugh, like why doesn't that exist? Yeah. Which is why, and again, then we'll go right into the topic, but it was one of the benefits of just being able to be open and honest about these things that seem to be taboo to talk about, right? Because, yeah, you know, like I know totally. we have both benefited from other people who've been public about their stories and their histories, and then it allows us to be public about ours. So, yeah, I feel Yes, like. absolutely. All right, so let's let's get to the primary topic because obviously we're already on the verge of it from like six different angles already. <laughs> you know this topic is about, or podcast is about one topic you're really passionate about. Can you tell me what are we going to talk about today? I think post-evangelicalism mm -hmm. is the topic and what my, my thoughts, experiences, lessons, and thoughts about leaving the church, leaving faith. Mm-hmm. Um, 
uh, of taking something that was central to my identity for the first three decades of my life yeah and uh and actually central to my family's identity mm. and then moving on how that happens and then what happens after is something that doesn't get talked a lot about mm -hmm. and um that term post evangelical can mean different things for different people for some people it means they've left faith entirely mm -hmm. and that would be where i sit mm -hmm. for some people it means uh they've left um evangelicalism in particular mm -hmm. and maybe they've gone back to a a more traditional or liturgical uh uh church or something yeah. like that um, and and for the purposes of this conversation, evangelicalism, uh, I would define it as a brand of Christianity, mm -hmm. fairly modern. Mm -hmm. With the it has uh, it it's it's like the it's in its extreme form. It's the church you see on TV, right? It's the Joel Olstein. It's the right. mega churches. It's uh, political. Um, lobby groups and organizations like focus on the family mm -hmm. it's uh mission trips it's uh, uh outreach you know christian outreach to teenagers and college students primarily um it's that whole thing yeah. and uh uh would you would you define it any other way? Would you add or subtract from that? You think? Yeah, there's a tiny little bit of um, like more theological space, just in case anybody like has a theological bent. Evangelicalism came out of um, fundamentalism in the early like 20s and 30s, and fundamentalism at that point didn't mean what it means now. It just meant we want to go back to the fundamentals, and evangelicalism kind of defined itself. I think the way they talked about it, it was like Billy Graham and then John. I don't think it was John Stott. Maybe it was John Stott, but a guy basically in the UK and Billy Graham were kind of like the two global spearheads. And they defined it in a book called Evangelical Truth that was basically about evangelicalism. You've got mainline Protestantism, and then you've got Catholicism. And that's kind of how they saw it. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's way more than that. But in their mind, the mainline, which is like the, if you look at all like the Presbyterians and Methodists and all that kind of stuff, usually there's one one half of those denominations that are like, you know, LGBTQ plus affirming and women priests. And then there's usually one half of each of those that's like not. So the ones that are not mm -hmm. are the evangelicals. The ones that are, are the main line. And then you've got Catholic. And of course, there's a lot of other denominations in there. But historically, it's been the majority of like North American white Christian religion that isn't yeah. either progressive or Catholic or super yes. fringe, right? So all the non-denominationals tend to be evangelical. Baptists, evangelical, you know, all the big people you see. So that's the only thing I would add to it, so. Yes, and 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 maybe, um, not most importantly, but, but crucially for people like you and I, and a lot of people listening, is that it's the most, um, it, it, it was very strong, it has a strong culture oh my that God, intersected yeah. with capitalism yes. and politics and media. Yeah. And we grew up, I was born in 1980. Mm -hmm. I grew up when this was happening. So Christian bookstores and music stores mm -hmm. uh, in every city in North America, uh, media properties like VeggieTales and Christian music yep. and Christian concerts, Christian movies. So it, it was the, the first time really where... Christians had their own culture, mm -hmm. and that meant their own media, that meant their own magazines, that meant you could grow up um, and you had an alternative to whatever was yeah. not Christian and yeah. not church. And uh, it was a way of, you know, parents kind of protecting their kids, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I definitely grew up that way. Of, yeah, me too. Of, you know, I wasn't allowed to, my kids are, this, my kids think this is hilarious, but I was not allowed to watch the Smurfs, wasn't allowed to watch, uh, uh, what was it, Ghostbusters, we just watched uh -huh. Ghostbusters the other day, uh -huh. and, but I was allowed to, you know, get anything I wanted from the Christian bookstore, uh -huh. and, you know, we would visit frequently, yeah. you know, maybe <laughs> once or twice a month, Oh yeah, and buy new CDs, 
you know, I'm really into stand up comedy. The first stand up comedy I heard was Mike Warnke. Like, it I don't was know like who that is. Sorry. Baked, is that recent? Mike Warnke was like a former Satanist. Oh, yeah. Quote unquote, okay. Uh, uh, and uh, stole most of his jokes from like Bill Cosby. Oh and like, <laughs> it's, 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 but, you know, I remember the odd thing is is growing up in that there's a strange nostalgia that comes with mm -hmm. all of that mm -hmm. so the same way people feel about their favorite tv shows and their favorite music and their favorite events or whatever i still feel even though i've left the faith i still feel that towards yeah <laughs> like i have good memories of listening to mike warnke tapes yeah. on family trips and laughing i have good memories even though he's been proven to be a fraud and a huckster since then. Yeah. Um, you know, I have good mem I, I, uh, my first real business hero was Phil Vischer, hmm. the guy that created VeggieTales. He just seemed to be doing everything I wanted to do. Yeah. He created this company. He created, he was making animation. He was, it was, he was having this, uh, big impact on the culture. Um, and so there's, there's, for me, one thing I think about a lot is there's, there's really not a lot of public discourse about growing up in that culture, mm -hmm. uh, cause it, it was at its strongest in the eighties and nineties yep. and, uh, is now not as much of a thing, partly because like, uh, I mean, even streaming has, I think affected, the cultural, like when you had the Christian bookstore, it was like the center yeah. of the Christian culture. Um, and you had uh, Focus on the Family, had some magazines for teenagers, uh, Breakaway for guys and Brio yep. for girls. Yeah, Breakaway. And, you know, that back then you could, uh, the internet was not very big mm. and you could if you were going to get your kid a magazine subscription, that kind of would dictate the kind of culture they would be exposed to. Yeah. And so it was a lot easier back then yeah. to say, well, you know, we're a Christian family. We're just going to read these magazines. Yeah. We're going to watch these movies. We're going to buy this music. Yeah. You want to go to a concert? Who's it with? Where are you going? Oh, it's with the church youth group. Okay. You can cool. go. Yeah. You yeah. Know? It was like, Safe. it was, it, it was easy. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and interesting on all sorts of all sorts of ways like the yeah. there's there's bands i've i've since i've become an adult i've become friendly with mike herrera who's the lead singer of mxpx really which is like <laughs> yeah which is, which is like this it was like kind of in the in the punk rock section of the christian bookstore they were uh -huh. like the big and they yeah, could sell one. out huge venues and yeah. and um I've talked to him about this a few times. He actually doesn't, he's not a big fan of talking about this connection, but <laughs> the, that distribution channel for them was massive. Yeah. Like it's, it's one of the only times in history where people have, um, ha where bands, for example, have had that kind of distribution and it allowed a lot of like artistic people to, um, and creative people to, get, you know, some traction and mm -hmm. get an audience and build up, you know, a following. And, uh, again, I think that's the only time in history that that's really happened. As long as they behaved, right? As long as they behaved. Which is, could be yes. an entirely separate podcast if we wanted, but yeah. I, okay. So uh, the, the, since I've left that culture. So I was, I, I worked for a Christian evangelical organization doing, uh, events for high school students, mm -hmm. camps for high school students. And, um, I let you, you, uh, for me, I moved away from Christianity slowly. It mm -hmm. was like nudge by nudge, bit by bit, until one day you wake up and you go, man, I just don't feel like going to 
church anymore. Mm -hmm. And then um, hanging out with different people. So once I was no longer working with Christians, yeah, uh, meeting with Christian donors and Christian mm -hmm. leaders and Christian small groups, my new social group became like the people I was hanging out with in tech. And one thing I've learned since then is that really we are just a reflection of the people we hang out with. Come on. That's so much the truth. <laughs> that's so true. And that was striking for me at first because previously I thought, well, no, there's this, there's this inspired truth mm -hmm. in this book that was written thousands of years ago. And that is what's creating this identity. That's what's, what's informing this belief. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I could be wrong about everything, but my experience since then is that you just end up reflecting the people you hang out with. Mm -hmm. And I've had this experience also, um, even like moving to a new neighborhood or a new town, you just, start, <laughs> yeah. you just I moved from Alberta, which is like the Texas of Canada uh -huh. to BC, which is like the California, yeah, Portland, -ish. yeah, whatever. exactly, yeah, West Coast, Seattle, yep, and just that move, yeah, nudges me over, yeah, and one of the things that's been a struggle that I, I think I'd like to explore if we have time. What yeah. time are we at? We're good. Yeah, in okay. theory, we got another at least twenty minutes. So, is when I left and I decided that I was done. I ripped out all of this old stuff, feeling like these were old, useless parts mm -hmm. that I no longer needed. Yeah. So, uh, prayer, gone. Mm -hmm. uh, traditions, gone. Uh, s small groups, gone. Uh, you know, just take all these things out. Yeah. And, and let's say that transformation happened between the ages of 28 and... 32 mm -hmm. um, from 32 to 40 as I've reflected yeah one thing I'm realizing is that some of those things were good things mm -hmm. that maybe I shouldn't have thrown away so fast interesting yeah so I'll give you an example um uh, why pray before a meal if you don't believe in God? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> it turns out that that practice of like a family gathering together, uh -huh. sitting down together, and there being an official start to the meal where everyone gets grounded, maybe you hold hands, yeah. you take a breath, you close your eyes, there's some silence. That act, that tradition, that practice actually has tons of ancillary benefits yeah. outside of maybe connecting with a deity that's there. Yeah. And we just threw all that stuff out. Mm. And in retrospect, I think it, it caused us to have, be a little bit rudderless mm. where the, the, the benefit of religion is you have thousands of years of practice. And some of it is not good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe a lot of it is not good. <laughs> yeah. But but there are things in it. Some of these practice practices, some of these traditions mm -hmm. are incredibly helpful for human beings, for families, for societies. Mm -hmm. And by ejecting those, um, why did I say ejecting like that? <laughs> Because you're Canadian. <laughs> By I ejecting. Thought, I thought that's how Canadians say it. <laughs> like an adult. Eject. Uh, by, 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 is, is it eschewing or eschewing? Eschewing, I think. I don't actually know. I think it's eschewing. That's how I always said it. By removing those <laughs> from our lives, it uh -huh. was like taking these pillars that had always been there mm -hmm. and just like, nope, don't need these and not thinking about whether they were load bearing walls or not, mm -hmm, just we're, mm -hmm. we're, we're taking everything out. And it's been interesting for me to think about that. It, the, it, it also leads to this profound problem that I've heard reflected 
from other people. I was listening to Noah Kagan. Mm -hmm. He's the founder of AppSumo. Um, and he said one time, he's like, man, I wish there was a church for atheists. Cause hmm. he's like, I'd like to go somewhere every Sunday, meet up with people I like, have somebody communicate a message that, yeah. you know, is somewhat, uh, challenging for my life mm -hmm. and then be able to talk about it afterwards with people over coffee and cookies. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> like that sounds kind of good. <laughs> and I, again, there's this like period of like, when you leave a religion, I'm sure this is true with any, like, you know, uh, Amish people, any, anybody mm -hmm. that's left this very, this kind of embedded identity that was in religion. Yeah. And then, like, at first, I think it's common to say, well, that was all garbage, and mm -hmm. I'm never doing that again. Yeah. And invariably, it's like people come back and go, man, like, I wish there was something mm -hmm. for... Uh, non-religious people or people that are not spiritual in that way mm -hmm. where we could have some of these traditions that really human society has developed over thousands of thousands of years mm -hmm. and maybe are just good, good for us. Yeah. Yeah. For us. Mm -hmm. And then uh, it seems like in the pendulum, <laughs> this is where people end up going back to like, uh, what you might call a mainline, like yeah. a church with liturgy. Yeah. So uh, in Canada, that might be like the Anglican church. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, well, I'm just going to go back to a church where <laughs> at least I, I don't have to be invested spiritually. Yep. They're not going to, they're not going to ask me to come on stage and um, sing with a microphone and a smoke machine. And, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> but, but I'm going to be able to sing some hymns. Yeah. I'm going to be able to be thoughtful. I'm going to be able to have this practice mm -hmm. that grounds me. And yeah, it's strange in my for <laughs> in my forties to as someone who's been fairly like like even my brother, who's this kind of tough biker dude. Mm -hmm. We were talking about it some at some point. I was the last. I'm oldest of four kids, last of the kids to kind of leave the faith. Okay. And uh, my brother goes, "So you're not spiritual at all?" I said, "No." <laughs> And he said, that's weird. Yeah. He's like, that's messed up. <laughs> and, um, but to reflect on it and be like, wow, like, uh, the, I am missing something. Hmm. And it would be great to sit in a pew. Mm -hmm. It would be great to sing those songs. Hmm. Uh, th that's the other thing. Like, if you talk to my wife, I sing hymns all the time. Hmm. I sing old DC talk songs all the time. <laughs> yeah. I can't help. I can't help myself. Yeah. It's super cringy too. Like mm -hmm. my kids will hear, what are you singing? I don't want I, your sex I, for now. No, <laughs> not until we take a vow. <laughs> Some old school stuff right there. I, I, I played a song for my 16 year old and it's like, <laughs> it's like Toby Mac. It's like, yeah, boy. <laughs> Oh god! And and my sixteen year old was like, "Dad, this explains so much." He's like, "This guy," he's like, "This so guy corny. is you." Really? That's he's like, awesome. This guy is you. It explains your personality. <laughs> so there's like some things that I would actually probably like to rid myself of, but <laughs> on the other hand, maybe I don't like yeah. the the. My wife asked me why I keep singing hymns. So there's like mm -hmm. certain hymns that come back to me. I, I don't believe in the spiritual significance of them at all, mm -hmm. but I do, uh, but I'm coming around to the idea that they're good for my spirit. Mm -hmm. That, that, and it, it takes me back to this idea that atheism as a thing is still, um, it lacks a lot. Mm hmm. It lacks these practices, these traditions, these grounding forces that uh, are really helpful for human beings. Mm -hmm. And there's no real good atheist hymns. Actually, that would be an interesting. That would be if anyone's listening and they have some good atheist hymns, yeah. please send them to me. 
Because I actually heard, have heard of somebody who did like a church service for atheists, and I was choosing not to Google it until we finished talking. But now I'm I'm actually very curious to see what what else is out it is out there. Yeah, like what are the practices of, and it goes beyond music. Like, of course, there's there's uh, incredibly moving uh, secular music, mm-hmm. but the but what we're missing is this is the the uh, participatory mm-hmm. element yeah, congregational of, right I'm, it's like everybody uh, together congregational mm-hmm. it's not just me it's not just me listening mm-hmm. it's not just me listening and singing lyrics to a song because i like the tune or even i like the message it's this communal togetherness mm-hmm. of of uh, humans expressing things together. Yeah. And there's so many dynamics of that, that it's hard to explain if you've never experienced it mm-hmm. of some of it, I think is just theater that, that, yeah, you know, that people of faith put on, but some of it is like, you're singing a hymn and the guy behind you, his voice cracks because he's emotional. Mm-hmm. It's, that's just like this one little element of that act of singing a hymn, but it all of these things are cumulative and add up to an experience that is incredibly profound. Mm-hmm. And so I've been exploring some of this stuff of of like what can I do now for myself? And then also what can I do? For my family. Yeah. And one of the things I've come, and maybe it's why I wanted to talk about it, is one of the conclusions I've come to is that it's very difficult to do anything like this, to build practice in isolation. Mm -hmm. You almost, you need the congregation. Mm -hmm. You need like-minded people coming together for the same reason and you need it on the rails in the same way mm-hmm. that uh, a programming framework puts a, a, la- a programming language on the rails and it mm-hmm. just like, it's all here. Yeah. Like, I, I just install Laravel and it just yep. bop, 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 bop. It's yep. all there. And the the idea of church has all the scaffolding mm-hmm. right there. Mm-hmm. It's That's like, a good word. And, and, and actual very well thought out. And some of this was done for manipulation, mm-hmm. like... In youth ministry, we would sing energetic songs at first. Mm-hmm. We also understood that, like the singing together, has other uh, psychological and sociological effects. Yeah, that can be used for manipulation. Yep. This is the both and because, on the other hand. It can be used for manipulation, but it can also just be good. Yeah. This idea of coming together and, you know, most churches follow this kind of this, this feeling is you sing the energetic hymns first Mm -hmm. and then you have a little interlude and then you sing a bit slower hymns and then you have another like scripture reading and then you sing the really slow kind of thoughtful, mindful. It's all just preparing you Mm -hmm to be in this place where you can receive a message Mm -hmm. or whatever. And again, part of this is manipulation, but looking at it from another perspective, I also am recognizing that now that I've kind of gone through my cynical stage of saying, well, that was really manipulative. Yeah. I'm now in the stage beyond that where I'm like, but there's also something really helpful about that, Mm -hmm. about going into a place and you know you're you you're burdened by the events of the week and by the the pains of your present or whatever mm-hmm. and you sing something that's really hopeful and triumphant yeah and makes you raise your voice even like in psychology we're learning that the expression of things outwardly like rage therapy and all uh-huh. these these things that people are exploring now it's all in church, man. It's mm. like we're gonna sing this thing out. You can sing as loud as you want. You can ah, you can yeah. just let it out. And then okay, now we're gonna bring it down a notch. We're gonna get a bit more contemplative. Mm-hmm. 
And now we're going to bring it down a notch. And I mean, in churches with litur- uh, liturgy, liturgy, <laughs> this is what people like is that yeah. it's like, dun, da da, yeah. da da, pause, think, yeah, pray, be quiet with your thoughts in the midst of other people being quiet with their thoughts. Okay. Now let's pray together. And now let's, let's have a message about mm-hmm. something in your life that maybe you need to think about. Mm-hmm. Let me give you some hope. Let me give you some correction. Let me give, you know, like there's something about that that is incredibly powerful. Mm-hmm. And so the, in isolation, I've tried to reinvent some that. of these uh-huh. things. I think it's actually why people like conferences, you know, very interesting. And I mean, it also explain why if anyone's heard me speak publicly, uh, if you think of me like a preacher, it, it makes more sense. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is what I'm used to. Mm-hmm. That is what, that is the way I've been trained, but it's also kind of what I long for mm-hmm. is the, the talk I gave at the last Laracon in New York was, I think the title was Why Growing Old in Tech is Hard. Mm-hmm. But really, it's a sermon about being in your 30s and 40s and how to work through real life struggles mm-hmm. and maybe how to have some hope mm-hmm. at the end of it. And it's just, I mean, it, it's exactly, not exactly, but it's very similar. Yeah. Um, to, to, uh, and I have a, I do have a concern about this, about the performative nature of preaching. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, um, so let's just set that aside, but you know, like I, I gave that talk and there's a lineup of people that want to talk about it. Yeah. The cynical part of me goes, this is just, you're just playing the evangelical playbook and now Mm -hmm. people are responding the the less cynical part of me goes, but people just need this. Yeah, people just need to have a connection with other human beings who are willing to get past the skin level, outward level, mm-hmm. uh, surface level stuff, and really dig into the guts of pain and joy and mm-hmm. triumph and failure and this is where I'm at today and we need it. Like we actually probably do need it weekly. Mm -hmm. And then when we get it from a conference talk or we get it from one of the new, uh, what do you call a bad preacher? Uh, uh, you know, like the, the, the the Tony Robbins of the world, you know, Um, like the, uh, prosperity theology, televangelism. Yeah. Shysters. Like, yeah, oh, but Tony so Robbins. Like though, a, talks, Tony Robbins is not a preacher, though, right? Isn't he a motivational speaker? No. Okay. Yeah, motivational speaker. But I think the longing, what people go to Tony Robbins for, is oh, yeah. this thing. And I think what I'm saying is, I think, and I could be wrong because this is just where I'm at in my state of life. Again, having left faith, having then been cynical about faith and completely cast it off. And now getting back to this point where I'm like, ah, oh, maybe there's something here. Yeah. And then going through the process of being cynical again, and I'm like, well, I don't want to be like Tony Robbins, but then moving even past that and yeah. going, but there's a good version of this. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And what is it? Yeah. What's the best form for it? And if, if human culture really is not that old, it's like maybe thousands of years old, mm-hmm. uh, really, I think the oldest traditions we have, or I don't know, three or 4,000 years old, something like that, maybe older. I don't know. Um, I don't know. What would I mean, you I, say? I know. Well, I know that there's a lot of things where like this thing was invented in often China or the Middle East hundreds of thousands of years ago. So I imagine there's some, but I do know that the majority of Western culture starts within the last three, 4,000 years. So, yeah. So thinking like if, if in the context of the universe, if humans have the human society has the possibility of existing for hundreds of thousands of years or even millions of years, we're still very early. Yeah. 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 And if we're going to,
if there's going to be a big group of people, and again, maybe faith like is just so useful. Like there's definitely days I wish I could go back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I'm guessing it, there will always be a place for people who are religious and spiritual, mm-hmm. and it will continue to serve them in the ways I'm describing. But my guess is that as human society progresses, there's going to be a big group of people who are atheists. And what are the practices, the cultural things we need to set in motion now so that in hundreds of years or thousands of years, we have this scaffolding Mm -hmm. for people who might choose to be this way. Yeah. And uh, I think part of me gets hopeful about that because Mm -hmm. it feels like it's possible. And in North America especially, but most of Western culture, this is fairly recent. Mm -hmm. This movement, like, like church attendance, like, Traditional church attendance is uh, in Europe, in Canada, in the United States is decreasing. Mm-hmm. So, but it's fairly recent that this has happened, yeah. right? So, what are we going to do for all those folks <laughs> that that have left? And it it's I, I think it's going to require some experimentation, some experimentation in my own household. Mm-hmm. But there's also going to be this um, there's going to need to be connection mm-hmm. in where instead of atheism being uh, or non-belief or post evangelicalism or whatever camp you're in being this very private thing mm-hmm. that we don't talk about mm-hmm. where, you know, even talking about some of the stuff like, singing DC talk songs is so embarrassing, (laughs) but at the same time, again, like where's the spaces to do this? Yeah. I think, I think the, the state, the stage we're at now, we require more connection. There needs to be people reaching out saying, Hey, you know, this is what we're doing. Hey, um, you know, even every Saturday morning when I can, I walk down to this coffee shop and I, text message a few people and we get together and we just talk about intellectual stuff, about life stuff, about whatever. It's like a small group. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. But that act is so helpful. Yeah. And uh, when I do it, even though it feels like a small vote for, Mm. you know, something bigger, it, 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 it makes me feel like, it's building up to something mm-hmm. better, a new scaffolding, new rails that maybe I can, I won't fully benefit from, but maybe my kids will benefit from mm-hmm. and the kid, their kids after that. Um, looking again at all these things that we grew up with and separating the good from the bad and saying, you know what? This practice was actually very good. Yeah. How can we incorporate that into our context um, in a way that matters? That was incredible. <laughs> I, mean, I, have, I have so few questions to ask. I have so few contributions to make. I'm like, well, wrapping up. <laughs> and since we are late on time, I do want to. I want to. I, I what add one little note that you don't need to respond to, but I want to note that like my particular place of post evangelicalism is I still have faith, but I don't believe that the evangelical, like the white evangelical church, is a good and healthy thing for for faith or for non faith. Um, so. I'm, mm-hmm. you know, some people would say I'm ex evangelical, but a lot of, I have lots of feelings about all those things that I will not talk about now, but a lot of the but, needs that I feel are very similar to the ones that you feel because I can't find mm-hmm. a church that I feel super comfortable attending. I can't find a church. I feel comfortable taking my black children to that. I don't think there's going to be weird white supremacy issues. They're going to be embedded in weird polit- political things. You know what I mean? Like there's so many mm-hmm. aspects here where I, I miss a lot of those same things that you do. Right. Um, and so while some of them are a little bit easier for me, like I could still pray before dinner with the kids and it's not weird. And I talk about faith with my kids and they say, well, does this exist or does that exist? And I'm like, well, daddy thinks this, but he's not sure. Mommy, I think she thinks that, but you can go ask her and other people think other things and we're all going to have to figure out on our own, you know, and sometimes we'll say, here's some things that I think everybody in your life believes. 
uh, for example, we talk to them about the ancestors and that's something that's, you know, common across a lot of religions and also common across a lot of black cultures. Talking about the fact that like mm -hmm. your ancestors, we believe, um, still are in a place where after death, they can see you, they can be a part of life, your life. They, they care for you. They root for you, whatever. We believe that we're going to see them after death. That's not something that we're saying is absolutely true, but your mom believes it. Your dad believes it. Your aunts and uncles believe it, you know, blah, blah, blah. And a lot of people in the world mm -hmm. believe it. So if that makes sense to you, then you can choose to believe that too. So we have space for some of these conversations that are a little bit easier because I, while I'm not in evangelicalism, I still get some of these faithy benefits, but there's still a lot of ways yeah. where I resonated so much with what you said of like, I still miss. And you know, like I have, I've got a mastermind group with a, that's kind of like a small group. And I've got a group with a couple neighbors that I meet with together once a month to talk about our finances. And we have meals yeah. afterwards and they're, you know, one of their, their daughters make me little, little, we love you, Mr. Matt cards. And, and it feels like a small group. So I'm like getting a lot of those moments in my life where it's like, oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, I missed this. So I yeah. feel you. And, and to not, again, I think this, the state I'm at now is to not be ashamed of some of those impulses. Right. Or yeah. not even to be ash ashamed to borrow yeah. some of that stuff. Yeah. And also not to be ashamed. Like I, there were some, there were some high school students mm -hmm. that I, um, I was a big part of their life. I was a big mentor for them. Mm -hmm. And now they're grown up and they have families and I couldn't talk to them for years and mm. finally giving myself the permission to be like, this is, it's okay to, to be who you are and where you are. Yeah, yeah. 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 I love that. And it's, it's okay to be acknowledging mm -hmm. that some of these desires you have are just good desires mm -hmm. for community, for connection, for tradition, yeah. for daily, weekly, monthly, seasonal practice. Mm -hmm. And and to see the evidence of that, like Christmas and Halloween mm -hmm. and Easter, like these are just um, religious holidays that have been turned into secular traditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And there's a reason why we did that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's because it, there's something helpful about yeah. them mm -hmm. that the practice is actually perhaps the most important part of it, mm -hmm. that the feelings that we get aren't just like throwaway feelings, but the feelings of warmth mm -hmm. and family and food yeah. and, you know, nostalgia from when you were a kid. Yeah. These are all actually things that we need. Yeah. And it's okay and to want them and seek them. Right, like it's okay to want them and seek them, even if you are leaving behind some things from the past, and especially if you're leaving behind some some of the truly toxic things in the culture that needed to be, yeah, called out. Um, it's like there there's some of that stuff that just needed to be called out, but again, there's some of that practice that was good. Yeah, <laughs> and so uh, yeah, I think it's okay to recognize that. I love that. Um, I'm going to add one last thing, one last, it's okay. And then move on to our last question. Um, uh, first of all, thank you. Everything you just said was amazing and insightful. And I really appreciate your openness. Um, oh, well, cathartic for me. Thanks good. for listening. <laughs> of course. The, the, and of, as always, I could talk to you about this for like another three more hours, but time limits and everything, but I was going to say, it's also okay. And it's not shameful to go get those things from religious spaces. If you're not in a religious space, mm -hmm. like I am not an Anglican. And I would have no mm -hmm. qualms whatsoever with going and sitting in an Anglican church and receiving what benefit I can from there. And to be honest, I don't know any Anglicans that would be like, uh oh, there's an atheist in the pews. There's a guy who doesn't know what his faith is and so doesn't go to church in the pews. They'd be like, cool, you want to listen to God? We, we're here for it. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think anybody has any issue that if, if totally. anybody's in any space and they want to go participate in those things for whatever reason, I'm just going to hold it against you, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And this is the, again, there's, <laughs> the 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 Catholic Church and the uh, Anglican Church and a lot of church, Lutheran Church, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they have a lot of bad history. There's some there's some bad stuff in there. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that um, necessarily <laughs> that it's it's a bad idea to go to one of these incredible cathedrals mm -hmm. and sit down and benefit somewhat yes. from that environment. Yeah. Um, of course, if you were truly traumatized, then that wouldn't be a good experience. Yeah. But, um, 
I think some of that exploration is good. I, yeah. I like that addition. And maybe I will. Maybe I will. Uh, yeah. My parents would be delighted. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. I'm like, you can say, I am an atheist. I'm going to go sit in this church for atheist reasons. And all the Christians in your life will still be like, ooh. They'd be excited. <laughs> and I mean, I'm speaking yes. to myself as much. Like, I'm, I'm, I have not left the faith, but I have not found places other than friend relationships where I feel like I have like space for spirituality. And so there's been a lot of me that just keeps going, can I go to a place that either just for me or even me for me and my kids that I don't think is toxic. Uh, and maybe we mm -hmm. have to have conversations about it afterwards, but at least bring something into their lives and gives them some opportunity to make their own decisions versus me making them all for them. Right. So like, it's just, it's, there's no hard and fast. I mean, and you, you mentioned like you felt like you had a hard and fast rule for, for close to a decade of, I just can't touch that stuff. And it sounds like a lot of what you're saying right now is, you know what, like I can figure out what's good for me. You know, I can figure out what I need. And sometimes it looks like those things that I ran away from. Sure. This new reality is definitely a lot messier. <laughs> yeah. It was a lot easier Turns for my out. parents and my parents' parents when it was just, it was the it, easy. It's just the, the script is there. Yeah. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't like engage with the mess and figure some stuff out. And maybe mm -hmm. what comes out is something really good. Yeah. I love that. All right. To keep us from talking any further, <laughs> last question. <laughs> What insight or support did you receive or need when you were younger that you hope more people will give to others today? Mm. I mean, this is where the, I think the model, especially in evangelicalism, the way, this is not universal. I'll just tell, talk about my experience. Yeah, but just the way you. I got taken care of from leaders and mentors, um, it wasn't all good advice they gave me, but the, I, there's no doubt that I would not be the person I am today mm. if it wasn't for a lot of that care. And for me, the, the, <laughs> the messy example of this is, you know, in 2016 or 17, I went through this truly traumatic experience and an old Christian mentor called me just to see if I could fix his website. And I ha have had a real hard time with this guy since leaving the faith, mm -hmm. like his Facebook posts and political beliefs mm -hmm. are um, heinous to me. Yeah. Like I cannot stand uh, what he says. Yeah. But, uh, he instantly recognized that something was wrong mm. and cared for me and really loved me um, mm. in a genuine way, in a sacrificial way, mm. gave hours and hours of his time, took it upon himself to call back every week mm. to see how I was doing. And it's possible that I would have done something very destructive to myself if he hadn't stepped in. Mm. And so I, I bring that up partly because online, this guy's a cartoon mm -hmm. of the most, like some of the most despicable stuff. Yeah. And, but, but personally I'm saying, and I, th there was nothing, um, <laughs> I know some people might could be cynical about this. There was nothing, unhealthy about mm -hmm. the care he showed for me or um it's not like he had any sort of power over me or mm -hmm. anything like that yeah. i'm telling you this was as genuine as any, anything you've experienced mm -hmm. and i that to me um is important and i think the way the 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 way that um mentorship and leadership worked for me. There's also a lot of abuse for mm -hmm. others in this scenario, but it, yeah. the way it worked for me was really profound and genuine and pure. Mm -hmm. Um, even though, you know, some of the stuff they said, I think was not right, even though, you know, it, it, uh, maybe they pumped me up a bit too much. Maybe mm -hmm. they, gave me too much of an ego. There's, there are, there were some downsides, but there's a lot of that that was just very healthy. Yeah. And 
when I look at my own kids, I'm like, man, there's just times I wish there was other adults mm -hmm. in their lives besides the parents me yeah. that cared for them in that mm -hmm. way. Mentors, leaders, um, you know, trusted adults that um, can help kind of guide them along the way. So that's something that I'll never forget. It's, and it's probably, it's also the thing that I'm trying to, I think about Yeah. in terms of like, as parents, we are so limited. <laughs> you can do, you can do, you can do the best job you can, Yeah. but you really do need other people, mm -hmm. other community, other adults that care about your kids. And, um, I think it's important and yeah, for sure. I would not be here unless I had that. Love that. It takes a village to raise a child, right? Yeah. 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 It's true. Well, I've said this already, but this was freaking brilliant. I look forward to having you on again. Next time we'll talk crypto. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> that will that will be the full arc. Yeah. Uh -huh. Going from <laughs> evangelicalism to the modern atheistic religions, which is crypto. I cannot wait to talk about that. I'm looking forward uh, to it, man. Uh, yeah, ha yeah, have you back. And also, if people have uh, some atheist hymns they want to send me, please yeah. DM me. Well, perfect timing, because I was going to say, how can people follow you? How can they support you? So where do they send it? Where are you? If people wanted to pay you money, what, you know, just tell us about your stuff. Sure. I mean, if you're into podcasting, go to Transistor.fm. Mm -hmm. My blog is JustinJackson.ca, where I write about business 80% of the time and this personal life stuff about 20% of the time. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll change that. And Twitter, I'm the letter M, the letter I, Justin, M, I, Justin. I learned the story of why you're M, I, Justin. It was delightful. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm stout for Matt because I was an idiot and got some stupid acronym when Twitter started. And by the time I realized I wanted Matt stout for some guy had taken it and is squatting on it. And so I'm still fighting him trying to get it. So if we could go back, if oh my we gosh, go back. we only knew, I mean, if we go back, I'd buy Bitcoin. 10 years ago. So, I mean, yeah, I'd probably see, make I some wouldn't. other changes, but you know, <laughs> this is the crypto, debate. This is the crypto debate. That's of, where we're going to go. We got to have next yeah. time. Or, yeah. or would I not buy crypto Bitcoin? Yeah. That's where we're going to go next time. All right, Justin, you're the man. Yeah. I really appreciate your time, dude. Thank you so much. This was really wonderful for me. Thanks, Matt. Good. And for the rest of you, I'll see you next time. And until then be good to each other.